best presenter is here, and he's going to talk about the integration of geochemistry, geophysics, and geology of the pathogen. Great. Well, thanks very much uh, for having me. It's good to see a lot of familiar faces in the room. Uh, today, I'm, I'm just going to really focus, and this is going to be a bit of a brief discussion, because I could actually talk hours about this, but uh, the integration of uh, the geochem, the geophysics, and the geology of the Patterson Corridor with a focus on uh, the discovery of PLS and then the discovery of the aero deposit. Forward-looking statement you can find on our website. And just to kind of get you to focus in on where we're at, uh, Southwest Athabasca I'm defining as this box here. Uh, Next Gen's SW2 claim is right here. Our Rook 1 uh, properties right there that contains the Patterson Corridor contain, contains 9 kilometers of strike length. It's a, it's a known 15 kilometers of mineralized strike length on the Patterson Corridor so far. When I put this figure together, I, uh, I was going to draw in the corridor, and then I realized, no, you don't really need to. You just need to connect the, uh, the red blobs and the red dots, and there you go. And one thing that's really interesting is the triple R has a strike that runs that way, and the arrow has a strike that runs that way. And they actually intersect, the strikes intersect right around there, and there's been a little, very little exploration. Uh, on next gen's part in that area, so hopefully we'll, we'll be getting to that area somewhat soon. Uh, so just running through quickly the discovery uh, chron chronologically, it's uh, PLS was discovered in November 2012, so it's really only been five years since the first discovery, uh, and, and things have progressed extremely quickly. Uh, then Arrow was discovered in February of uh, 2014, followed by uh, not too long after, just a month after the Spitfire Zone, by Pierpoint Chemical, Reba, JV, uh, and then in, in uh, the discovery of Bowen, March 15, by NextGen, that was following up on some anomalous uranium uh, that was drilled by SMDC in the 1980s, uh, and then also the, the R840 West Zone was discovered in March 15. Now, that also includes the R600 West Zone, which was discovered a little bit earlier than that. Uh, and then, of course, Harpoon was discovered by NextGen in uh, August of 2015. And uh, that's really just an extension <coughs> of the Spitfire zone. I believe it has a, about a strike length of 400, 500 meters uh, when you combine the two mineralized zones. Uh, furthermore, Fission uh, discovered the 1515 West uh, zone in uh, March, in the winter time. And then the most recent discovery is Next Gen's South Arrow uh, discovery, which was July of this year, and that's just located 400 meters south of the Arrow deposit and just a little bit outside the Athabasca Basin. So I'm going to take you all the way back to the point where significant work started in the Athabasca, or sorry, started in the Patterson Lake area. And Canadian Occidental and Oil and Gas Company was the first uh, company to really give a good crack at it. And they actually did a really good job. They, uh, they flew airborne EM and uh, they came up with some good conductors that uh, they don't go too far off of the more recent surveys that were done by uh, Alpha Fission uh, for VTEM in 2012. Uh, that was followed up by ground EM and uh, again, the, the, the results here were, were very good, especially considering they weren't using state-of-the-art GPS um, or any of the new fancy technologies that we're privy to nowadays. In 1977, they also hit the ground and did a uh, radiometric survey, uh, sampling along north-south lines. Uh, There's a number of small anomalies, but this one down at the bottom kind of showed uh, some really strong uh, anomalism. Uh, and then what's interesting is it's actually down ice from the conductor corridor, which is the Patterson corridor right there. What really made that radio the, the radiometric anomaly exciting was putting the radon anomalies on, on top of it. Because radon only comes from a uranium source. Thoron only comes from a thorium source. So these are, this is a legitimate uranium anomaly. And uh, it was also found to be associated with very high, uh, high uranium in the soils as well. And again, it's down ice. The ice direction is northeast to southwest. It's a good, uh, it's a good story that was coming together at that time. Unfortunately, 
the Canadian Occidental, they uh, they wrote off this anomaly as well. It's it's an impressive anomaly with six stations. Uh, it's about 1.4 <coughs> by 1.6 kilometers in size, uh, but uh, they really just said that it's it's responding to radioactive exotic boulders. So that says to me that uh, these boulders they thought came from way too far away to be of interest. So they kind of lost the idea and the momentum on this disappeared. And then in 1978, they uh, had a new project manager and they were off to new ideas. Fast forward all the way to 2008, and here's the treasure map that uh, was a big part of the discovery of the PLS deposits, first the R00 zone and then the triple R zone. Uh, and, and what it really is, is a combination of all, all the canoxy work, Canadian Occidental work that was done. Uh, during staking, there was a radioactive spring found down here. Uh, there was also, from some good GSC work, uh, there, there was some uh, lake sediment samples found down here with, uh, that's got uranium up to 3.5%, nickel up to 77 ppm, sorry, 3.5 ppm. and. Uh, and really encouraging results, and then another lake sediment with 3.8 ppm, where the background's more like 1 ppm. So, uh, and then further looking into the assessment reports, we, we noticed, uh, you know, hole 36 right there, it was drilled into clear water domain rocks, and it, uh, it returned up to 16 ppm uranium within a, a fairly fresh 2 mica granite. And this presents itself as a very good source rock for uranium in this area, so it helped bring the story together. And then whole, whole CLU-12, that was also a pretty important hole as well because it, uh, it hit a very strong graphitic shear zone uh, and it was also associated with very anomalous nickel and copper values. Uh, also, from, from some of the previous work, it's identified that the last uh, ice uh, direction was from the northeast to the southwest. You could really confirm it from the drumlins and whatnot. The Alpha Fission JV did a, uh, uh, a quaternary study and it confirmed that as well. Uh, this was followed up in 2009 by a state-of-the-art airborne radiometric survey. Uh, it was high resolution because it, the lines were 50 meters apart and the plane was flown about 20-25 meters off the ground. It did an excellent job of, of showing the outline of the high-grade boulder field. It also correlated well with the historical results. And this was a spectrometer survey, so it actually pulled out the uranium down here, which uh, had some priority one type uh, hot spots. And you'll see there's an anomaly up there, and that's got a bunch of blue little spots, and that was high for potassium. And it turned out that, that was just a big pile of clear water domain type rocks. So nothing of, of great interest, but it's interesting that it showed in historic holes and then it was also picked up in great detail in the 2009 Airborne Survey. So it took two years to scrape together money to, to do a, an actual boots on the ground. It was tough times for uranium, um, especially because Fukushima had just happened in March of 2011. Uh, the boulders were discovered in June of, of 2011. A total of 156 boulders were discovered, ranging from you know, 100 ppm uranium up to 40%. Uh, it was in 2011, 2012. They were quite soft boulders, that almost like they had come from the regolith. They were sub-angular, sub-rounded. They didn't come from very far. So it was actually very exciting to get that confirmation from all the previous work that had been, had been done. <coughs> and also knowing that the ice direction is uh, situated down ice from these beautiful conductors that are, that are coming through here. So, Putting all this compilation work together now with the boulders, this presented a good exploration model going forward, and really what the main target was, was a window of opportunity. And this is where you've got quaternary sand and gravels sitting in direct contact with basement rocks. And the reason being is because all the boulders were basement hosted or just massive, massive uh, pitch blend. So it was pretty straightforward. Where those boulders came from, there's no Cretaceous, there's no Devonian, and there's no Athabasca. In the winter of 2012, a uh, VTEM survey was flown across the, across the property and it, it uh, revealed a whole slew of beautiful VTEM conductors. There's a lot of bright spots on there. 
Uh, it, it correlated quite well with Canoxy's work, but I would say it pulled out, picked up a few more conductors than, uh, than their work did. And one thing you'll notice, that, that yellow star, that's where the initial discovery was at PLS, and it's not on the bright spot, it's just off. And that's, that's something that you can probably notice from a few different deposits around the basement, is that these, these uh, discoveries won't be on the bright spots, but just right adjacent to them. So that's, that's pretty important. Further work that was done ground geophysics at uh, PLS, it included MAX-MIN, TDEM, uh, DC resistivity. The MAX-MIN survey did not work very well at all, and it was, uh, it, was, it was because of the Cretaceous mudstones and the clay lodgment till. Even when the survey was done uh, away from them, the influence that uh, they had on such a high frequency type ground survey scattered the signal, and the conductor axes weren't accurate. The, uh, the, the TDEM was very good. It was a squid array, small moving loop TDEM survey, and uh, it really pinpointed the top of the basement uh, where it met uh, the quaternary or, or other sediments. And uh, the offset that was seen between the VTEM and the TDEM was anywhere from zero to 60 meters. Uh, the resistivity anomalies, there, there was nice blowouts at flexioners in the EM conductors and, and uh, blowouts are just uh, along the disrupted portions of the EM conductors, which are very important features when exploring. So the second uh, drill hole that was put into the PL3B conductor, which is the conductor that hosts uh, RRR and, and all the other PLS deposits, uh, was hole four, and this was this was pretty interesting. It uh, encountered Devonian sandstone that had class of Athabasca sandstone within it, and uh, so this really let uh, let everyone know that um, we're pretty close to the edge of the basin at one point in time. The Devonian itself was comprised of basement class as well, and it was elevated in radioactivity throughout. Uh, and then looking under thin section, it was noted that uh, some of the quartz grains had been damaged by radioactivity. So it was all kind of an interesting piece of information that uh, started to make more sense as the, the exploration progressed towards discovery. Looking at uh, hole four again, now it was drilled uh, vertically into a VTEM conductor. So it was actually about 30 meters that, that VTEM conductor was about 30 meters offset to the southeast of the TDEM conductor because at, at the time of drilling, it was only the VTEM conductor that was available. But uh, given there was a vertical hole, uh, it basically hit the foot wall or the hanging wall and it stayed in it the entire way. The hanging wall itself was uh, quite quartz rich, semi pletic rock, and it showed really good redox fronts. There was some elevated uh, geochem in it as well, so it uh, it would be that area was revisited uh, not uh, too long after. Additional drilling during that program in the winter of 2012 uh, showed <coughs> hole 13 uh, had one of the better intercepts in, on the PL3B conductor early on with 24 meters at about 115 ppm, uh, and it it seemed that as drilling progressed <coughs> further to the northeast along that conductor. That the geology alteration, the radioactivity all improved to the point where hole 16 could almost be argued that that is the discovery hole, potentially, because it's 10 meters away from the actual discovery hole. But uh, this intersected 140 meters of good, good clays. Pima revealed it was pseudoite, magnesium rich chlorite. Uh, it had a few pretty good intervals, three, three and seven or eight meters of over 200 ppm. Uh, and again, this was drilled vertically on, a, on the TDEM conductor. Uh, and you might be asking why, why was there drilling vertically on these uh, conductors? Well, the answer was the, call, the drill contractor at the time uh, was unable to drill angled <coughs> holes through the sand and gravels. So it, uh, it was really limited to just vertical holes. And so that was actually very important, like having the TDEM and being able to move the target 30 meters to the northwest. Of, uh, of the VTEM conductor. But in retrospect, if the drill contractor could have just drilled an angled hole, then it would have, it would have been a lot easier. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So, so yeah, then the, the fall program started up and uh, it didn't take too long. It was a, a 10 meter step out to the northwest of hole 16, hole 22, discovery hole, had eight and a half meters of 1%. Uh, it did have Devonian sandstone there, so that wasn't the source for the boulders, but uh, um, it, the, the boulders are located about 3.8 kilometers uh, to the southwest of, of this drill hole. Uh, and it really just suggested, okay, well, maybe the source of the boulders is in the lake. So next program in the winter of 2013, went forward with doing radon and lake water sampling. And this was a very important survey that was done. It, uh, it showed, really picked up the 390 zone, the 585, the 780, and the 945. And it, it made them really, the discovery process, it expedited it very well. The 390 zone, when it was drilled, is really interesting because the mineralization was always 10 meters northwest of the t dam conductor. But then when you started to go further along to the northeast, that uh, correlation uh, went kind of wacko. But what helped stay in the mineralization was the radon in lake water <coughs> anomalies, as you can see. And that's the, uh, the R00 zone, the first discovery zone in PLS right there. Oh, I forgot to mention that uh, that accumulated into a overall resource that uh, was about 108 million pounds at about 1.7% for, for PLS. So uh, the work that was done there was incredible and uh, it has a great result. So switching gears now to, to Arrow, and, and uh, frankly, it was a lot easier of a discovery than, uh, than a PLS, because for one thing, Arrow is completely a blind deposit. There's no geochemical signature, and there's a nice uh, Cretaceous mud cap sitting right on top, so I don't even think radon would have picked up uh, anomalous quantities, because it would have just, just capped it. So there, as uh, Ken was mentioning, there are three main components that led to this discovery. Uh, it was a disrupted uh, VTEM conductor. The thought was there's a cross-cutting structure ripping through there. The edge of a uh, pretty strong magnetic gradient, depends what uh, type of mag you look at. And, uh, and then also it's within a very strong uh, gravity load that was just a bullseye. It stuck out just like a sore thumb. So it was, it was fairly simple to justify drilling that. Fast forward three years and uh, after 200, over 200 drills, we're at 307 drills now actually. Uh, the total resource is just sitting at about uh, combined indicated inferred about 302 million pounds. Uh, again, about 2.5% is the average average grade. So after, after the discovery, we started kind of reflecting on, uh, on some of the data that we previously had, uh, working with Ondork and uh, one of the things that the ad tau really showed something interesting to me is that, again, I mentioned all the, the all the deposits, the, the mineralized zones, they're not on the bright spots. So you can see arrows right there, it's not on a bright spot, but it's kind of close to that one. Cannon, uh, you can say that's a bright spot, and it's right next to it. Boat, bright spot, but it's off it. Spitfire harpoon, bright spot's down here. So it, it's interesting to see that offset from, from the, the ad tau it's, uh, and, and something to consider when going forward. But I do understand that at Eagle Point, I mean, one of the discoveries, I believe it was at the Powell Zone, that was completely correlated with the bright spot. So nothing's always the constant. But also we, we had uh, Maxwell modeling of the, of the VTEM data, and this was hugely important because before going in and drilling a, a conductor, we actually, through thanks to the Maxwell plates, we were able to know which the strike was and the dip. And so this really expedited, we're not having to drill to guess like which way things are going. And, uh, and it also really, uh, really showed good uh, strengths of conductance as well uh, in, in good detail. So preferably going from a strong conductor that's becoming weaker is a, is a pretty good, good spot to be. One of the breakthrough surveys actually for this portion of the Patterson corridor was the ZTEM uh, survey flown in, in May of 2016. Uh, it really gave us a big picture and, and for the first time it connected PLS up with the Aero deposit with uh, Bow and Spitfire. 
uh, and understanding that those are all at uh, different elevations, but, but to have that kind of big picture moving forward is, is really good. Because just based on the, on the VTEM, it kind of looked like, like PLS's extension would go that way, hence all the drill holes that we have right, right in that area. But not was the case. And then you can see where the two uh, strikes of PLS and arrow intersect. There's really no, to, to, there's little to no drilling there. <clears throat> Looking at, uh, and one of the key things with the Z-Town was doing a 3D inversion. And that's, uh, I think that's the way going forward. It's all about 3D. We've got to work in that to uh, continue to be successful with, with discovering in these areas where we're undercover and we have to rely heavily on the geophysics. <laughs> so what you're looking here is uh, the arrow deposit uh, facing to the northeast. Arrow matches the resistivity load just beautifully. And uh, yeah, you, it, it's a point that you couldn't even argue with. Uh, th then when we look at the cross-section through the bow, uh, bow zone and uh, this survey came after the bosons. We actually haven't drilled it properly. We have not tested the resistivity low corridor in that area, but we've got a few good sniffs up there and, and down there. Uh, then there's the Harpoon cross section, again looking northeast, uh, totally untested uh, down at depth. And this has actually become one of my most favorite uh, surveys uh, is this ground. 3D resistivity done by Diaz Geophysical. Uh, what you're looking at is the initial grid that we, we planned out in uh, October of 2016. We did it because we wanted to see if there's any extensions to Arrow um, and, and what kind of signature it showed and if that would help us further along the, the corridor. We hadn't discovered South Arrow at this point in time, but uh, when the results came on, you can see there's a beautiful conduct of uh, anomaly associated very closely with the arrow deposit. But what really tweaked us is that there was this anomaly that was open to the southwest. So that's actually what led to the discovery of South Arrow. It, it, uh, none of the other geophysical layers actually were very promising for South Arrow. So that was not a high priority drill target. This 3D survey got us vectored in there very quickly and we got to discovery very quickly. So that, this led us to do an extension of the grid just recently, we completed in October. And uh, we really like what we see from there because this, <laughs> this conductive blob continues all the way to the, to the southwest. And it's good to see that uh, there's a break here. This could be, I don't know, a cross-cutting structure or a big fault, but then it seems to start back up over there. And that's, that is not tested sufficiently either. So things are looking pretty bright for the winter 2018 program. And, uh, yeah, that's how we're going to move forward. That's all I have for you today, but any questions? <laughs> <laughs> uh, when you're doing these uh, subsequent surveys, and there's already equipment on site, drills are on site, how do you filter that out? How does that affect the survey results? Uh, like for the 3D resistivity? That one recently, and some of that work did that happen? We, we were, um, with that, we were a little concerned that that might be an issue with uh, eight rigs turning, but it actually was not an issue. So, it, can you see where the rigs were and just filter it out? Or? There, they, there was no, uh, no. no disruption to the, to the survey. Yeah, the only thing that there was a bit of a conflict with was the, uh, the gyro survey, or the, it was either the gyro or the reflex survey, but uh, we found ways to get around it. But yeah, in terms of the results that came back from, from the 3D uh, resistivity survey, there was no issue with the data whatsoever. Thanks, Brett, for the interesting talks. Uh,